Okay, let's start. <clears throat> Don't want to surprise anybody, but you have a midterm on Thursday. Uh, and it covers up to the topics as of last Thursday. So what I wanted to do today, today's kind of like the third of the trajectory optimization lectures. And I, uh, where I, in all the other previous three lecture sets, I kind of built up. This time I tried to get through the, the main ideas already. But I want to kind of go back through today and not, I mean, I'm going to introduce some new versions of it, but it's kind of the intention is to exercise the things you've seen and uh, you know, give you a few more examples, give you a deeper understanding. So let's do it. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, I'll try, to, I'll try to give more. I mean, I only at the end of last lecture talked about finite horizon LQR. I want to make sure you appreciate how powerful that is, give you some examples to so, so you have some more intuition about it. Um, I wanted to show you that the sums of squares we did for regions of attraction can also work along trajectories. I, probably not surprising, but maybe some of the mechanics will, will uh, look like this. So when we used to talk about regions of attraction, now we'll talk about sort of funnels along trajectories. And that's if you've seen reachability analysis or other things like this, that's going to be deeply connected to that. And then um, we'll get to iterative LQR at the end. OK, so uh, the big idea in the trajectory optimization lectures right, was that the way we're fundamentally trying to beat the curse of dimensionality is we're restricting, instead of looking at all states, we're looking at a single initial condition, right, and we're just optimizing over time. The good thing about that is that it breaks the curse of dimensionality. You don't have to think about all of the x's and the high dimensional x's. The bad thing about that, and sort of it's fundamental, it's not like, um, is that if you don't look at all the x's, then you can't guarantee you found the best solution. So you have local minima, except for you know, exceptional circumstances where we know things are convex and we know, you know without looking explicitly at all the x's, we know that we're, they're well behaved and they're, they're worse than what we're looking at. But in general, you know, if you don't look at all the possible states, you can never be sure that there wasn't some other state that was really good, you know, like maybe a pot of gold over in x10. Uh, that, we, that I didn't look at. OK, so in the trajectory optimization world, we talked about a few different uh, transcriptions, right? We did the direct transcription. Direct shooting transcription and the direct collocation were the ones we spent a little time on. And they're, in general, very powerful formulations where we can take potentially nonlinear dynamics, call a nonlinear solver. Uh, <clears throat> even with my connector. OK. Um, they all actually, I didn't mention this before, but they all have the nice property that if you happen to give them a linear dynamical system and you don't try to mess around with stretching time, then they all reduce to a convex optimization, even direct co-location. For the most part, mathematical program will figure that out and call the convex solvers for you. Okay, but they're all capable of a lot of different of, of the nonlinear formulations. These give um, open loop trajectories, right? Just a trajectory over time, and that's not enough, which is why we started talking about trajectory stabilization last time. But I added the, the examples I showed. I said I was missing last time here, but So let's just take it as, a, as an example. Um, we'll do the direct collocation for the cart pole. Oops, we have to run the first cell. OK. 
Okay, it instantly finds the trajectory and it takes a little while to make my matplotlib animation, but we get a nice trajectory that swings up and balances at the top. Okay, this is the plan playback, I would call that, right? So the trajectory optimization solved for x and t, actually, right? It also solved. That, were, that satisfied the numerical integration constraints up to the tolerance of the solver and up to the time step size that I specified, okay? And this animation was just playing out the X that came out of the planner, okay? If I put the, the cart pole in exactly the same initial conditions and I now just run a simulation, integrate forward in time with U of T as just an open loop trajectory then that doesn't go as well. Exact same U played out. It sort of tries, but that's as close as it ever gets. Right? So <clears throat> even if it was exactly the same initial condition, the only thing that changed is my integrator effectively. Right? I'm just solving it with a different level of accuracy in my simulation loop versus my numerical integration in, in the trajectory optimization loop. And that's enough because these systems require stabilization to be successful, right? The model's perfect. The only thing that's different is the integrator. But, you know, in the real world, the differences would, well, not only would the differences be because you used an integrator instead of the world's perfect integrator, uh, but any disturbances or anything like that would cause it to not succeed. So what we developed last time was the LQR version of that of how we could stabilize that. So we took the thing out of output of the planner and I built a time varying linear system around that. So we described it as with A of T B of T, and maybe just to be a little precise, so the this was defined over some interval of time, we'll call it T0 to T final, right? But that's a finite trajectory. And similarly, this these definitions are defined by taking a linearization at any of the times on the trajectory, so they only also exist, are sort of well defined over that interval. Okay, and then we did a, um, a time varying LQR over this finite horizon. I called it finite horizon LQR. The time varying sort of snaps in easy, easily once you're in the finite horizon setting. And this gave us a U bar of T, which is more, right? It's negative K of T x bar of t, which if I unpacked that from the error coordinates, that looks like u, the nominal input plus some feedback term in the coordinates of the desired trajectory. It also gave us a cost to go function. That was a time varying cost to go function. Okay, so <clears throat> that solution comes out of a Riccati equation. Again, instead of the Riccati um, algebraic Riccati equation, we solved the Riccati differential equation over time, but the math is almost exa exactly the same. So you can just call finite horizon, make finite horizon linear quadratic regulator, give it the times, it'll do the linearization for you, make the controller. And then this is, thank you, later, okay. Now we have running a simulation back with the feedback controller in the loop, we get to the top and we balance, right? And there's the slight differences in U nominal versus U actual that happened because of the feedback control. And that's the state rollouts that just are slightly different than the original. Yeah? How do you choose your 
the horizon came out of the trajectory optimization. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, sometimes in the direct in the direct collocation, we let it stretch and shrink in order to accomplish the goal. But even if I set this to a fixed time, I think tragopt would have worked in the it would have just taken a little longer in the swing. And then yes, the finite horizon works exactly over the interval. Same interval as that's defined. Yes. It is. Thank you. Wouldn't make sense otherwise. Good call. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I, I obtained just to say it so everybody hears. Yeah. I got this from trajectory optimization, and I became a, a component in my controller, right? But this extra k term that was missing if I just played it out, that came from LQR. And that's a recipe that works. Like if I do exactly the same recipe, I don't even change the gains. You know, it's just 10, 10, 1, 1. <laughs> Always, if I can get away with it, right? That'll work for the Acrobat too. This is the Acrobat swing up. Trajectory optimization goes up. I didn't make the Acrobat not working one, but I guarantee it wouldn't work. The Acrobat's much more finicky than the carpool. Uh, and then with the controller, then it nicely gets up to the top, even in simulation. Right? So it's a pretty good recipe. But I want to dig a little deeper in that. So um, let's get over here. Algebraically, it's very it's very little that has changed from what we did in the LQ, original LQR. We just got some time, so we had to you know, solve the differential the Riccati equation a little differently. But but basically, the the Hamilton Jacobi the recipe the derivation is almost unchanged. But it's doing something very cool. Like you have to appreciate what's happening inside there. Uh, and to make that explicit, let's just think about the uh, cart pole here. Okay, so I'm going to say what I I'm going to do what I said I wasn't going to do before, which is even gravity is set to one. Okay, I just just wanted to keep it simple. Yeah, so all parameters set to one, then you get something that looks like this. Because what's important is not the effect of gravity in this example, but just the uh, the coupling, the way the coupling works in these equations. Okay, so the state of the cart pole is theta and x, right? The force of the cart comes in, and it has sort of a direct effect on x double dot, of course. Okay, it also has an effect on theta double dot. Okay, but you can't, you don't directly actuate sort of the the, the theta doubled up, but because of these cross terms, uh, you get to force gets to affect both x double dot and theta double dot. Unless cosine theta is zero. And then things start getting hairy, right? So what is what happens there? Okay, so that's like this. That's this case, right? So when my pendulum is like this, if I have cosine Theta equals zero, which would be a, theta is pi over two. Okay, then suddenly this term disappears. This term disappears. I'm, I've got a theta double dot by itself. I can't affect it directly, right? And my f term doesn't get across. So I don't have any instantaneous control of the pendulum angle when when theta equals zero. But I still got to the top. I was still able to stabilize it. So let's just appreciate that what LQR is actually doing is it's taking you through places. Of course, that, I mean, it's dramatic at the instant where theta is zero, cosine theta is zero, but there's a kind of a, a degradation. There's a loss. When cosine theta is close to zero, your control authority is bad, right? But we're going to move through there successfully and still get a good stabilizing solution. Now, to plot that, so I wanted to sort of plot the numerics of the solution. I want to plot 
s of t along that trajectory the, from the, you know, my, my cost to go is x transpose s of t x. So let's just look at s, okay? s is a 4 by 4 matrix, but I'll just look at the largest eigenvalue of s, okay? Okay, so plot finite horizon LQR results. Here we go. So theta does its swing up, okay? It crosses this twice actually, but the, on this first crossing, uh, the lambda of S gets really big. The largest eigenvalue of S gets really big. So what does that mean? Let's just think about what that means. That means when S is big, when the large eigenvalue of S is big, that means a small deviation in X. Any small errors in X lead to big cost. Okay? So if your S is big, then, then your cost to go is growing very rapidly, and you want to be really close to your trajectory, otherwise things could go really wrong, basically. Okay? But it manages to still obtain a reasonable uh, cost back at the initial conditions. So even though it's going through this like terrible uh, loss of control authority in the middle, because we're reasoning not instantaneously but over the duration, we're still able to accomplish the long-term task. That's good stuff. That's like solving a hard problem, even though it's just linearization, right, uh, over time. It's actually, so maybe the picture I want you to have in your head it's uh, hard, it was harder for me to map plot live this, but let me see if I can sketch something like this. So um, if I wanted to plot, like how would I plot this, right? So this is, well, first of all, it's in a four-dimensional space, okay? So I'm going to just pretend and draw a two-dimensional space, okay? But um, at every moment in time, this looks like a quadratic form. And the way we've been drawing that before is just by picking a, a level set of the quadratic form and just drawing ellipses. Okay, so let me make the primary axis time here, and somehow I've got kind of like a, some other axes here, which are like x and q, and there's actually four of them, which I can't draw. Okay, but, but roughly at time you know, t0, I've got some ellipse. Okay, and t final, Got some ellipse. If the, and each of the, so I'm, what I'm trying to draw here is like j of x t final equals a constant. That's like the, the some level set, right? Just like in the pendulum case when we were drawing things, we were drawing like this, right? This was um, j of x equals a constant, like one or something, okay? And we were drawing the level sets of the cost to go. I'm just trying to draw some level set of the cost to go. And what I see when I see the S getting very big, that means that a level set is gonna get very small. So somewhere in here, it's kind of going through this choke point. If I were to draw this contour over time, it's kind of going like this. Okay. Now the reason that's a good thing to sort of visualize is the controller, in order to be successful in the long run, it needs to actually do some work at the beginning and kind of hit that gap with relatively low error in order to be successful all the way at the end. That's what you know, kind of a, a level set of constant curvature would look like. So that's pretty fancy stuff, right? Um, so I, I, this is just the level set of the cost. When S gets big, the, the, the curve gets, or the circle gets small because I'm saying, you know, how far away from X until this thing evaluates to two, let's say. 
And if s is big, then you don't have to go very far from the origin to hit 2. So the bigger s is, the smaller the ellipse. And so in order to get a low cost by the end, you had to be pretty close to the tra nominal trajectory here in order to sort of achieve that cost to go. Yes? That's exactly right. It's actually, um, because it's in the error coordinates, in the, in the coordinates of the trajectory, it's just a, a simple quadratic. And if it's, if it's in the original coordinates, it looks like a, still a quadratic, but it's, an, you know, it's not centered at zero. It's centered on that trajectory. That's because we did LQR. You know, more generally, you'd see some solution that could be not, not just quadratic. The quadratic form came from LQR. So this picture is almost what I want you to think about when we start thinking about trajectory funnels, okay? Okay, we're gonna, this is kind of the cost to go version and we're gonna think about the Lyapunov version also, okay? And that's gonna be the one that we're gonna be able to go farther with just like we did in the non-time variant. But there's this important notion of somehow these sets that evolve over time and carve out tubes, okay? And reasoning about those sets, trying to make them big with good control, is it, is it an essential ingredient that we've now got all the tools for? Okay, so um, just to say that sort of as clearly as I can, let's just remember what we did for regions of attraction here. We did, we tried to make statements like this, okay? I want to find some function, and whenever the function is sub left less than some sub-level set, let's call that constant rho, okay? I tried to find, I tried to prove implications of the form that whenever it's less than rho, I have that v dot of x is less than or equal to zero, okay? And we could do that, for instance, via sums of squares. If I could prove this implication, it would be sufficient to say that v less than rho is an invariant set. Right? If I found some set where v is less than rho, and v is always going down in that set, then I know that it will never go above rho, it will never leave the set. What we're doing when we start getting into these sort of um, time varying things, we can do the funnel version is just a time varying Lyapunov function. Call it v depends on both time and x. I'd like that to be less than some row. And if I can say whenever that it's, is true, I have v dot of x less than or equal to zero, and let's say it's defined for all times in some interval. Then the same thing I can say, this implies that v of t of x less than rho is an invariant set. Over this, over this interval. That's the basis of the argument, okay? Is that if I start in t, the, the, the set is moving through time, okay? But if I can make the same kind of argument, that if I have a, a set that the value starts less than rho, and the value is only going down, I should put a t here, 
that in as the t there, okay, then, then it's going to still be an invariant set moving in time. If I start, if I can make an argument like that, which we've not made yet, but I'm sort of cartooning it here. If I started inside this set, then I know I could stay inside this set all the way through. That's when we think about, when we think about funnels. And if you're really good, okay, then you could say, you could try to find funnels so that the output of your funnel drops you into the input of the region of attraction of an LQR controller or something like that. Right? You can sort of find the biggest funnel that kind of drops you into a good controller space, then you've got something. Okay, I'm going to work through that carefully again in a second, but let me just kind of make it fun by showing you um, how this played out in our perching stuff. I brought, I brought a nice plane last time, and it was like, you know, up on the ceiling, I got it down or whatever, and then I thought, like, oh, there's a whole pile of planes over here. I'll pick up the pile of planes. But as I walked over, I realized I chose badly. This one's pretty wrecked, a um, little, little broken up. So this is roughly what a perching plane looks like. There's a bunch of them in the lab, uh, most of them less broken than that, sorry. Okay, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so we used all of these tools, I think, to pretty cool effect uh, when we were thinking about these robotic birds, okay? So this one here is also in the lab. It's a, a two meter wingspan bird. Uh, we used, I got really excited about flying. Actually, it was, it was funny because I went on my faculty interviews, right, and I was talking about my walking robot. And they're like, why? There's one person in particular, he's actually here, Greg Warnell. Uh, he said, why, it was probably just a sort of standard question or something, why walking robots? Why not something else? I was like, yeah, robot birds would be cool. And so I basically started, with no other justification than that, started working on robotic birds. Um, probably a little too early, like computers were heavy and, and batteries weren't that good. Um, I carried a PC-104 stack in the, in the middle, if anybody remembers what those were. That was like carrying a little, you know, the heart of your Pentium processor like around. Uh, and that's why the, the wings are two meters long, so that they could get enough lift to carry my heavy computer. Okay, but that was flying around campus, 2005, 2006. Uh, it was flying around. It, 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 normally it has a breakaway beak, but it was broken away before we took the picture, which is <laughs> a bummer, but uh, it did its job. Okay, so I got all excited about these birds, and then we started looking at like, what can birds do with these beautiful wings that, that airplanes don't. Some people talk about efficiency. I'm less convinced about that, right? I think propellers are pretty darn good at, e at efficient flight. I mean, maybe at the very small scales, the physics changes and rotary, rotary terms are more lossy. But um, the thing that think, I think birds do incredibly well is agility and also playing with the air, okay? So <clears throat> we got excited about perching in particular. So this is just a cardinal, but it, the, the point is it's landing on a perch. And if you someone put some smoke in there and you can just barely see, but the flow behind it is pretty messy. Okay, and in general, the picture you should have is that when you're at a low angle of attack, the air is easily able to go around your wing, and you get this nice attached laminar flow, and control is, you know, the simple models work pretty well. And when you go up and stall your wings, then the flow separates, and you get vortices shedding off the back. You get into a more complicated, more nonlinear flow regime. And in particular, your control surfaces are not in the attached flow. So you tend to associate it with a loss of control authority. Okay, so this is more like what it looks like in a flow visualization of a wing that's in um, install. Okay, um, so we thought, so we started trying to think about how to make big flapping birds do this, and then we thought, hold on, you know, let's just get it down to its essence. And this was like a, a, a long iteration of, of experiments to try to boil it down really to the essential ingredients. And in the end, we were able to study perching um, with an extremely minimal design, obviously minimal. It has exactly one actuator that actuates the tail. Okay, the, if you look from the front, it's got dihedral in the wings. The wings are, are tilted up. You know why? Yeah, good, right? So it puts the, just think about, it's like a, basically making it a pendulum. The center of pressure somewhere in the middle of the wing is, is above the center of mass. So it just tends, tends to hang out like this. So we didn't even have to worry about it turning off. It would naturally fly straight. It wasn't very good at turning if we wanted to, but for this, we were just trying to fly straight. Okay, and that's all we needed. We had a remote control for the, I mean, it would carry a battery on board for the, for the servo but, uh, and a small receiver, but that's pretty minimal. 
which is good because we kept firing them out of <laughs> the small cannons and, and breaking them repeatedly. So uh, it was good to not have our most expensive stuff on there. And the, the question was, you know, birds can land on a perch uh, in ways that I don't associate with planes. But is there any fundamental, is it a control problem or is it a mechanics problem? And so we tried to make airplanes land on a perch like a bird. Okay, so first we we're trying to figure out how to even measure success. Like what's a fair comparison? Because we're building things the size, you know, not the size of a 747 or anything like this. So we needed somehow to come up with a comparison. <clears throat> and so almost always you want to do dimensional analysis in this case. So uh, we felt that a fair dimensionless number to sort of compare big planes, small planes, whatever. And it's only a little bit fair because the, um, the wing mechanics are different. But roughly the drag coefficient, a distance average drag coefficient is a dimensionless quantity that we associate with stopping. And if you have a big drag coefficient, then that's cool. Um, I mean, parachutes, like on a, you know, if a drag racer puts out a parachute, that has a big drag coefficient. So that's, it's easy to get a big drag coefficient. I guess being able to hit a perch while having a big drag coefficient is the important thing. Okay, and so we did, went, scoured the literature and tried to figure out what the average drag coefficients were during, during a standard run, uh, runway landing. A Boeing was getting a 0.16. There's these super short um, landers, right, that, that'll try to do an extremely short uh, or super short landing at very high angles of attack, but with thrust vectoring. Uh, they were coming in at about 0.3 angles of attack. There was this cool concept from Cornell where they left their wings down so that the flow was attached on the wings where your control surfaces were, but they'd bluff their body up to get a, get a lot of drag on your body. That seemed really cool. They were getting about 0.25. And then we had these cool collaborators at Harvard, that in the, at the Harvard Field Station. They study real birds, and so we said, okay, get us some data from the real birds. What do you get for the common pigeon? It was kind of a bum. I, I wanted them to have like a bird of prey, or you know, like some like goshawk, or like something awesome. Um, and he's like, no, no, pigeons are, are the best at this. You want pigeons. Um, what do you think? What's the number? 10. 10. Right, which is not, this is where it's not completely fair because the, if the 747 was pulling 10, it would pop its wings off, right? Uh, <laughs> but that's like structures, I think, in terms of the fluid dynamics, I think the drag coefficient is fair. So we built this super simple setup, glider, no propeller, flat plate wings, the dihedral makes it passively roll stable, offboard sensing and control, this is like the first mocap, uh, really, like the... Um, when we bought the system, it was, we had so much feedback delay and stuff like this, and, uh, and it turns out that the, the default settings were um, wait th two seconds or something before you show the operator, because humans wanted to look over here and look over here. We're like, oh, get that out of here. You know, like, I, are we the first people to ever close a feedback loop through this thing? Um, we were a little too early, I think. But um, yeah, so you get these little simple planes. And then the interesting thing is, you'd think we'd go over to the Wright Brothers tunnel and do some SysID, right? But uh, it's kind of hard to do that in the post-stall regime, in particular because there's all these dynamic stall effects. Right? So what we did is we just fired the plane a bunch of times. We took the motion capture data, and we differentiated it twice. And we're like, let's see how, how well we do. It was beautiful data, really surprisingly good data. Okay? Now, you don't normally see lift and drag plots that go up to 140 degrees angle of attack. Like this thing literally would just you know, fall over and whatever. But, but that's, we got data all the way through here. Okay, um, this is, uh, it looks like it got really noisy here, but actually if you were to look at any one of them, it's actually the vortex shedding is going like this. Okay, um, this is just flat plate theory, which is, the, which is a dubious sort of uh, thing. Uh, there's not really, it's not quite Bernoulli or anything, but somebody sometime wrote up down this flat plate theory and, for, and it fits surprisingly well, okay. Um, I think the picture you should have in your head of a normal airfoil is that you'd get something better than this uh, before stall, and then at whatever stall you get, you'd fall down to the flat plate theory. Uh, so most aircraft will look like this sort of post stall, and it's just that a flat plate stalls at I don't know, one degree or something like that. Don't do quite it's something very small. I don't remember the number. Okay, so that's where we started with. We had built a very simple model, you know, sines and cosines basically, that actually was fit to the real data. Okay, <clears throat> and just to convince ourselves that we had actually gotten those vortices and understood them right, we actually built a small wind tunnel, put titanium tetrachloride on the front edge of the plane, borrowed a two megawatt laser, uh, 
and started taking these pictures. Yeah, and we got like the flow visualizations off the off the back of the um, of the plane. It was the first version looked like this. Um, we were not supposed to be there. It was like a place I found. Um, we got kicked out, and then I got a slightly better place. But it was pretty homegrown. Like the, my wind tunnel was uh, from Home Depot, you know, and we had a <laughs> bunch of drinking straws. It was our flow straighteners. But that was that's like you know, MacGyver science, right? Uh, it worked fairly well, actually. Uh, <clears throat> would not compete with the Wright brothers in any reasonable metric, but. Uh, so, but we, now we get down to like a underactuated sort of state space model, right? So we had planar dynamics, aerodynamics fit from data, state was seven dimensional because the, um, the actuator was velocity controlled instead of torque controlled, okay? Um, and so the control was theta dot, or sorry, phi dot on the, on the uh, tail. And as you know, I showed once before that we could shoot this off of a, um, Catapult, it was kind of fun building the catapults too. Uh, this was just a string that we put across the, the mocap arena at a known location. We'd fired in at six or even up to eight meters per second. It had three and a half meters away. The entire trajectory took about 0.8 seconds typically. And we could reliably land on the perch. Um, well, I have all of that, almost all of that, re-implemented now. Um, you can just run um, the basic setups, if you ever want to play with it. Uh, got to open the browser. Let me just disconnect so you don't see my to-do list. When I open the browser, you would, you would run away if you saw my to-do list. Okay, so simple state space model, do some direct collocation. It looks like this. You can actually, I, I plotted while the optimizer is solving. Okay, and it comes into a nice location, boom, it goes and lands on the perch. Yeah? And if you were to do the open loop, um, that's what the nominal thing looks like. If you do the open loop simulation, then you miss the perch badly. So this is the desired. The actual just goes way off, way, way off, okay? If you do the finite horizon LQR, you simulate it a bunch of times, then you get nice convergence from a lot of different initial conditions, always getting to the perch, okay? I think that would have worked over here if I had done it. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, okay, so, um, Here's the cool thing. Um, this was the project, first of all, this was the project that helped me realize how powerful linear time varying dynamics and LQR could be. I was, I was expecting to have to do much more sophisticated nonlinear control, but TV LQR, uh, sorry, the finite horizon LQR worked incredibly well, even on the complicated models. Moreover, we spent, this is the project where we spent a lot of time understanding how to build these backwards reachable sets, these, these funnels. So we had, in this case, a specification of what we thought was an acceptable um, set of states where the little latch we, that we had would land on the perch. Um, and then we just tried to find backwards in time the biggest invariant set that would say if I was started inside here, uh, I could get to the goal. Yes? It's, um, so it's, it's ignored, it's averaged through by our simple models, uh, and it seemed to be okay. I mean, I, I, should, I made it sound like, we studied it carefully, right? And the, um, you know, the effect it has on the elevator uh, is significant, but time averaged control still got through it. Yeah, so I think it's not the case that you lose control authority, it's just that the control authority is more intermittent and you have to, add, to think about, do longer term reasoning. Okay, so this is where we started really trying to understand these, these funnels, okay? And um, you, could, you could learn a lot actually by thinking about the, uh, the way those funnels grow or shrink. You know, you can learn about the control limitations of the vehicle. 
in walking robots, we'll see that there's, there's times where things get uh, dicey. Like, let's say, I'm, let's say I'm jumping. I'll, I'll jump through the air, and I'll instantaneously lose control authority until I get back to the ground. But by reasoning over the long horizon, we'll see funnels that uh, stretch and shrink, but do the right thing in the long horizon. And so um, Joe got to the point where in his final project before his thesis, he could just throw this thing and it would always land on the perch. This was actually a trajectory library, a library of funnels. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later when we do more planning stuff. Okay, but it pretty much always worked. So the question is, how well did we do, right? We went off after that and actually found some MIGs that were doing some of these kind of, uh, you know, in air shows, they were doing these maneuvers and they were pulling really impressive drag coefficients. We landed somewhere in the middle, you know, 1.1, which is pretty good, but, um, but no pigeon, right? Actually, so look at this picture, okay? I have re this is me reconstructing an old picture, but the old picture is on the screen here. You see it back there? And this is Rick. Do you know who that is? That's Will I Am. <laughs> and that's Rick, like, talking about flying, you know? Will I Am likes robots. And so he, he was, like, in the lab one time, and we were talking about perching, and, um, and Rick's like, yeah, that's, and, and actually, okay, I'm nowhere near as cool as Will I Am, and I cannot say this well, but so I'll just, I won't even try to say it in his tone, but he said, that doesn't surprise me. Pigeons are ghetto birds. They've got mad stop. <laughs> and we were like, that is awesome. <laughs> yes, that is so good. So that's like in the lore of, of the robot locomotion group now. Uh, so of course, we tried to build the, the bird, the flapping version of it too, OK? And um, I think this looks like, I don't know, a dragon attacking a rook, uh, you know, like a castle or something, right? Uh, I just think it looks so cool. Uh, and we did get it to work a bit. This was not every time it threw. In fact, the plane would break regularly. So, uh, but this was kind of the last hurrah before Rick graduated was getting some flapping flight landing with uh, all, the, all the tools. Pretty fun. And then the last piece of the lore is that this, this is Woody Hoberg. Anybody meet Woody when he came by not too long ago? Yeah. He was, in our, he was working on perching in RLG, and then he was up in space just very recently. And he, he was super nice. He's like, do you, do you have anything you want me to bring up to space? So we said, oh, let's bring a perching plane up into space. And he was awesome. He brought a perching plane up in space. And he's, he brought it back. I haven't gotten it back yet. But this is like the, the moral of the story is if you do control theory, you get to hang out with Will I Am and send things into space <laughs> or something like that. Um, I should have made a blank slide, so that's not up. But OK, so that was my fun little interlude. But uh, this stuff really, I think that project actually, in all seriousness, really convinced me of some of the power of these, uh, of these tools. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about that before I go back? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, it was, it was a limitation. I think both the bandwidth of the, and the velocity limits of the actuator, the small actuator, and the sample, the sample time was high enough. We were getting in the hundreds of hertz, which I think for this um, was, was OK. Uh, the delays worked the killer, the round trip delays. Um, <clears throat> we actually had a version of this. So Joe, who was throwing it in the video, um, his project was actually making it land outside on a power line. The Air Force was super interested in landing on a power line to recharge or hijack a, I don't, know, I don't know what you could do on a power line, but um, uh, so he did that actually, and he did replace the mocap with, um, there was onboard magnetometers on the nose and the tail, and you take the difference between the magnetometers and a known B field from coming from the, the power line to localize yourself relative to the perch, and he showed he could land on a perch outside. But the winds, of, <laughs> for when you're like this and you don't have a lot of control authority, the winds of, uh, I have some funny videos of it kind of like, you know, getting close and landing and then another time where the wind comes and it's just, you know, like, but not even close. I mean, it's just in the next neighborhood, especially around here, right? It's uh, so freaking windy in Cambridge. We used to joke that uh, 
a good project would be to take one of these gliders and see if you could make it soar all the way to Harvard, right? Um, which I think, it's still a good project, but I think the wind these days, like you could just throw a leaf and probably get to Harvard uh, with no control. So, so I, we never did that. <clears throat> okay, so let's make sure we understand some of these mechanics and how they sort of work out in these kind of projects, right? So um, in optimal control, when, um, when the cost to go depends on time, we had the slightly more um, general form of the HJB. We wrote min over u LXU plus partial J partial X. But we had to also include this partial J partial T, right? So, and this thing, remember, is my sort of my D DT of J of XT. That thing together. That's as soon as we have time. When do we get time varying cost to go? Right? We've seen a couple different cases. Having a finite horizon is enough to force you to be have a time varying cost to go. In fact, it's almost the it's almost more maybe the better question is like when do you not have a time varying? And that is the special case of when your dynamics are time invariant and you're working about the infinite horizon. Then the time drops away and you can solve the infinite horizon case. But as soon as you have a finite horizon, or if your dynamics are time varying, or your cost is time varying, there's a bunch of different things that can all make that suddenly have to depend on time. So the more general form is that, that the cost depends on state and time. Similarly, um, for Lyapunov, um, we can have time varying phi. You just have to think about what that means exactly, right? I started to foreshadow it there, but let's just think about it. So um, if I were to have a function that for all t, I had, so what I mean by that is for all t, for all x not equal to 0, And treating time kind of special, okay? But that's what I mean by the notation. If I can write a function that's positive definite like that, okay, and I take its derivative, its total time derivative, which is going to happen in two parts. Again, I have the direct dependency on x multiplied by the dynamics. Oh, I guess with Lyapunov we don't have u, okay. And then I have the partial v, partial t term, right? And I'd like this to be in the same way uh, for all x, you know, except for 0, it's going to be less than 0, less than or equal to 0. Right, so the analogy is, I mean, the, the workflow is the same. Again, I've just relaxed the, you know, I've relaxed this exactly equal to the rate of cost to the, this thing is just less than zero in the time varying case. And then I can make statements like this. Because this is the, remember for Lyapunov, we always have the, we can first say invariance or stable, stability ISL. If we have less than or equal to zero, we can say, um, we could say it's asymptotically stable if it's less than zero. The reason I didn't write that explicitly here is because stability is really a concept that goes, as time goes to infinity. You can have the same notion of that you're always decreasing, but I wouldn't call it absolute, I wouldn't call it asymptotically stable unless I'm actually defining 
the trajectory all the way to infinity. And similarly, you can have exponential rates of convergence. Okay. All those things work through, go through. They just also depend on time. We have one more term. Okay. Now, it turns out if you do have time, what I wrote here is absolutely true. You can actually be a little bit, uh, there's even a, a so slightly less restrictive thing that we can write that also proves invariance. Okay, so it's also true that if I have v of tech, t of x less than or equal to some constant, a scalar function of time, okay, If I have that implies b dot t of x is less than or equal to rho dot, then that also works. So let's just make sure we understand this. Okay, so we said the concept here was that let's say it was energy. Okay, right? If the energy was started at four, and I show that the energy never increases then I know that the set defined by energy less than 4 is invariant. Okay? This is saying now, what if I've got some rate that I care about? I've got some, some level set here. As long as I decrease faster than that function is decreasing, then that time varying function is, is still an invariant set. Okay, it's just a small generalization. That once you have time involved, you can you can put not just a constant, but a, a function of time. And this is what we do when we're trying to solve those funnels. I should put the funnel picture back up. Right? What we do is we, in this setting, is we take the trajectory optimization with direct co-location, okay? take the time variable linearization to solve the LQR controller, we use that Riccati, the, the cost to go from LQR as the guess for the Lyapunov function. And then we try to find the biggest row as a function of time that we can prove subject to a constraint that the final one gets in the goal. So we just try to push out, just like we did in region of attraction analysis, we try to push out and find the biggest row. This time we try to find the biggest row of T to push out. And the more flexibility we have, if this was just a constant, that would be pretty constraining. But having a, a function of time works well. Yeah? Nope. Nope. Yep. In, fa in fact, like the examples of the, the cart pull, you should see things like uh, increasing and decreasing. We can write this sort of implication with sums of squares. Sorry, yeah. <clears throat> I want it to be differentiable in time. Yeah. And then the, if you're going to use sums of squares, having it be polynomial in time is handy. Uh, in practice, a lot of times, so, so you can write these kind of things. So you, so you do this, again, for all over the finite interval. Sorry, I forgot to write that. Right? So you'd like to have sauce implications of the form for all x, for all t inside that interval. There's a bunch of details that come in, um, which I could write down carefully or could say informally. Yeah, let me just give you just a little window into the, the details of that. Okay, so. This is how all these things connect, okay? So I have x0, u0, okay, as of t. Abstractly, that's what I'm getting from trajectory optimization. But if I use direct collocation, one of the reasons I like direct collocation is this is now a piecewise cubic spline. Piecewise cubic polynomial or a cubic spline. Okay. 
this is a um, piecewise linear. Function. That's what we searched over explicitly with the direct co-location parameterization. Okay, so then we pass this in to this. We do time varying linearizations. We get back a, a time varying um, uh, Riccati equation, right? Cost to go. We actually represent that as a similar as a matrix polynomial in the same time parameterization. So we have the same knot points as the original trajectory that came in. We now have k as a function of time and s as a function of time, where the coefficients are represented as cubic polynomials. So I have this bundle of, for each piece, I have all of my dynamics are polynomial over some segment. So we do sums of squares in each of those pieces of the piecewise polynomial to knock out the, the verification. The time uh, adds potentially a lot of, so, to, so that was, then, then we try to say um, for all time between, you know, time from break one to break two, that ends up adding a lot of uh, multipliers um, to try to, to do that S procedure, okay? Sometimes we, oftentimes in all of our codes that we actually used, we just sampled time because it was as good like sampling in one dimension doesn't offend me. Sampling in high dimensions is hard, but sampling in one dimension is sort of okay. It's not a tight certificate anymore. We've given something up there, but um, we found that sampling was much more scalable and it seemed as good uh, for in practice. So we tended to sample over time and certify the Lyapunov conditions at each time sample with polynomials. Long answer to a short question. Okay. There's yet another detail, okay, which is that um, x0, u0, remember, are only feasible trajectories of the dynamical system. Like x0 is only a real rollout up to the numerical integration. So if you ask your Lyapunov function to prove convergence to a trajectory which is, only, which is not quite achievable, you know, it's only a, an approximation, and you're using all these powers of sums of square certification, you will fail. They will say, I can't do that. I cannot certify this Lyapunov function. So at best, we try to certify that it converges to a tube around the trajectory. Okay. So there's a lot of details in there, but it's all the machinery we think we've been thinking about. Yeah. Nope. Could be a demonstration. Yeah. Sure be a demonstration but you uh, yeah you could get that any way you like the cool thing is remember we talked about um, robustness analysis with the Lyapunov functions right we could try to find a single Lyapunov function that was satisfied the Lyapunov conditions for many different parameters of the dynamics you can do the same thing in this setting there's a robust the Apanov argument for funnels. So you can say, I will land on the perch even if the wind is blowing, you know, plus or minus. It's a pretty powerful pipeline. Okay, hopefully that's sort of convincing that it's a powerful set of tools. Um, <clears throat> so what did we do here, right? So we have this nominal trajectory, we have this time varying linearization that's kind of moving along the trajectory, if you will, right? So we're going to make at each, as a function of time, we're finding a linear, you know, this linear approximation of the, of the system. And it's hugely powerful, even if you're going through post-stall regimes, okay, as long as you're nearby the trajectory, the in the <clears throat> parameters, or in the regions of state space that are sort of near the trajectory, you can stay near the trajectory. Linear control's good. There is one thing that I, is a, I, kind of a big warning, I guess, about what happens with these. I think it was already called out once in the early, uh, when we first did time varying linearizations, okay, but um, this system is moving whether you like it or not, right? The, the Lyapunov invariance condition, for instance, says that 
if I was on the trajectory here, the, the, the Lyapunov function is moving forward. You had better move with it, otherwise you've broken the Lyapunov conditions. So if I were to come up to a system that was stabilized in this sort of time-varying linear way, and I were to just kind of like hold it back for a little bit, put some time delay in there, the, the error coordinates are moving forward. So suddenly it's going to try to leap back and catch up with time. So it's like a clockwork system. If you get behind in time, you have to catch up with time. And that's a major, uh, I'd say a major limitation. It's very tempting to say like, okay, I've, I've got my state here. Why don't I find like the closest point on the trajectory? And I'll use that linearization. And you can do that once, that's fine. But, but if you were to every time step, instead of using the time schedule, you were to take just the closest point on the trajectory, then you've introduced a mapping that, that LQR is not thinking about that, that reparameterization, and you can find Relatively a little contrived, but you can find simple examples where that just makes systems go systems that should be stable become un unstable if you if you try to remap time on the fly. There's a way to fix that, which we will get to when we do walking robots, because walking robots are all about um, periodic motions that have to be some more robust to that. But as as of what we talked about so far, there's this sort of clockwork time aspect of it that I think is a a little frail. Cool. All right. Last idea. Again, I think sort of building on all these things. We've sort of talked about three options for stabiliz stabilization. The one we've been talking about at the end of the last lecture and today is LQR. Typically, we think of this as the finite horizon version of it. Okay. We talked about using that linearization and then doing you know, linear MPC to stabilize. And then we also talked about doing the nonlinear MPC. Okay. So what do I mean by those three, right? If I have a nonlinear dynamical system, and I just solve, solve the nonlinear trajectory optimization every dt, that can work, but it doesn't give you many guarantees. Okay, so the reason you might like to do linear MPC is the same way that it, um, you know, it's limited by where the linearization is valid, but the solver can be put into a mode where you can have recursive feasibility, for instance, and have some guarantees on the performance that the solver is not going to get you. Now. The LQR solution has one extra step here, right, which is that now we can actually, because we're pre-computing and we get these things out that have nicely parameterized simple forms, now we could do even more. We could do like somehow verification and funnels up here. It's possible to do some amount of funnels with 
the MPC, but it's much, it's, a, it's harder, right? The virtue of this having an explicit form for the controller, as opposed to the controller being the result of a computation, like an advanced computation, makes verifying this much more tractable. Okay, so you were asking the other day, like, why would you ever do this if you could do this? And I think that's the reason is that it's more tractable for analysis, for instance, and often pretty darn good, right? So when does when does this do better than this? Uh, if you're on, if you're close to your constraints, if the constraints matter a lot, if you're close to input saturations, or if you have state constraints, then you should think about linear MPC as the generalization of LQR to the constrained uh, case, right? But if you're not near the constraints, and you have enough control authority, then LQR is gonna do as well. So that's cool. We can use trajectory optimization to do stabilization. MPC is tregopt to do stabilization. The cool thing, and the last connection I want to make in this, is, is you can do stabilization to do trajectory optimization. Yeah? That's a little bit of a weird way to say it, but you'll see what I mean. These things, I, I want you to think of them as being deeply connected, right? You could think of the LQR as solving an optimization problem on the local linearization, but it's solving the optimal control problem. If you roll it out from a single initial condition, you know, it's solving, it's like it's doing trajectory optimization. Same thing for this, this is clearly trajectory optimization. So it, <clears throat> if LQR is doing a form of trajectory optimization, and it turns out it's a very popular, actually, way to do trajectory optimization, is to actually use LQR to do tragopt, okay? Let me spell that out for you. This is the iterative LQR algorithm. Often known as ILQR. There's a closely related algorithm called DDP. close, but they're not quite equal, okay? A lot of papers say DDP when they mean ILQR and vice versa. Don't do that. Um, yeah, you'll see exactly, well, I'll, I'll point out the differences when we come to it, but they're, they're closely related. You've heard of DDP, I'll, you've, you basically know the gist of ILQR. Okay, and the idea here is let's write our trajectory optimization. The problem we're trying to solve is, let's say, min over x and u, I'll do the finite time, discrete time case, finite horizon, discrete time, okay, subject to arbitrary nonlinear dynamics, and let's say That's just one of the, our standard, very general forms for the nonlinear optimization. So that's the direct transcription, okay? And I told you one of the ways that the solvers look at this and tries to solve it is with sequential quadratic programming, where sequential quadratic programming, there's some details, but roughly speaking, makes a quadratic approximation of your objective and a linear approximation of your constraints solves the QP, and then continues, okay? 
So you can imagine a, you know, a quadratic approximation of this. A quadratic programming approximation would look like, let's say, min of, I'm going to make a quadratic approximation of that objective. I'll get something that looks like plus some cross terms, right? And even constant terms. Okay? But if I take a second order Taylor approximation of this, I'm going to get a quadratic form out. You can see where I'm going with this, yeah? If I take a linearization of this, I'm going to get something like this. It's actually going to be potentially affine. Okay. That's already linear. Okay. So you could do this and solve that with a quadratic programming solver. But actually, that problem, we don't need a quadratic programming solver. That's an LQR problem. Okay, because of these terms here, and this term here, it's a little bit more general than the one that we wrote down on the board so far, but it's in the notes, the full, the full form, okay? So it's a slightly, this is just a slightly generalized Okay, so actually one of the most popular trajectory optimization algorithms out there doesn't call SNAP at all. It actually just takes the function, makes a quadratic approximation of the objective, a linear approximation of the dynamics, calls finite horizon LQR, basically. I mean, uh, we inter typically the, the algorithms interleave this to sort of avoid recomputing things, but intuitively it's... Uh, conceptually, it's calling TVLQR, and it gets the new, a new nominal trajectory. If you were to simulate your controller forward, you get a new nominal trajectory. You linearize and take a quadratic approximation around this new trajectory, and you repeat. The same way a sequential quadratic programming solver would attack this, you can do that without calling SNOT. And it leverage the fact that it's a, the LQR, it's, a, it's an LQR problem. Okay, so for unconstrained if I started adding additional constraints here, then I could get additional constraints here, and it would not be an LQR problem anymore. You'd have to do something like MPC. You can do that. But tip it, it's more common, you'll see people who, who are doing iterative LQR will try to keep it, the problem unconstrained and throw a bunch of more, um, any other constraints here, they'll throw as penalties into the objective function so they can keep this abstraction and solve the Straight up LQR problem. Yes? No, you're right. Good call. Thank you. Those are time varying. And these are time varying too. And there's cross terms in. Yeah. Good call. So the, the reason this is doing something interesting, so the way we've been talking about LQR is that you're trying to stabilize, to finite horizon LQR is you're trying to stabilize to a known trajectory. Okay. But once you add these cross terms in, it's your cost function does not necessarily obtain its minimum at the nominal trajectory. And that's, the, in fact, the interesting case is that you have um, your initial guess at the trajectory. Okay, and the cost function is actually drives you, right, to some place that's, that's pushing you to sort of take another trajectory. And by continuing to chase this quadratic approximation of the original nonlinear objective, you can do trajectory optimization using LQR. Okay. 
It's more bespoke than the calling snopped. It can be more numerically um, robust or, and possibly very efficient if, you're, if you've written a careful, a, a good solver. But it's definitely one of the mainstream ways to do trajectory optimization. Differential dynamic programming, if you do come across it, um, is almost the same idea, but it, you tend to you make a second order approximation of your dynamics also. Whereas uh, iterative LQR takes a linearization of the dynamics. That turns out to also have a useful form. Just can be expensive to take the second order approximation of your dynamics, so a lot of people do, and use the ILQR form. Yes? So this, um, you have to linearize this around some trajectory, yeah, in order to get this. So you take an, your initial nominal trajectory, you get your AB matrices along those, and your QR matrices. You solve this, and then you simulate it forward, and you get a new nominal trajectory and you linearize around that, and you iterate until it converges. Very much the way you saw the perching plane, you know, it was uh, considering lots of different trajectories, and it would dial in and find the, the optimal trajectory and then go. You'd see ILQR do something very similar, and it's taking different linearizations on every one of those steps. <clears throat> um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that um, these trajectory optimization and Stabilization are very intertwined. Uh, LQR is the unconstrained case for linear systems. If you apply that repeatedly, you can use that as trajectory optimization. You could use that as an MPC, right? But it becomes it comes into the land of trajectory optimization. Okay, see you Thursday.